post. Oh, I think I was off. Yeah, on this uh, website, um, you will see the um, yeah data sets that we floated in there. You can explore this a bit. Um, then there's a Sphere Python package which we host on the Tesla uh, GitHub repository, and which is also on PyPy. And um, then lastly, there's also this local disk space proportion to Sphere, where essentially Sphere stores data sets, and we will discuss this later. But just for your orientation, essentially, um, this website, which you may or you may not have visited already, sort of reflects what's going on in the Python package, and the Python package then governs the disk space. Yeah, and here we see like um, a cartoon of how this disk space stuff works. Essentially, one part of uh, Sarah's functionalities is that it orchestrates download of raw data files to your local storage so that you can then use it. But it does a lot more beyond that, and we'll go into that. Sphere models then is um, another portion of what Sphere does. And we're not going to talk so much about this today, but just for you to contextualize what's going on here. Um, so Sphere models is again in the same Python package, and it's uh, mainly an uh, also Python-based API to query um, model parameter estimates. So it could be estimates of neural networks, for example, that you drop as parameter files somewhere on a cloud server like Zenodo, which a user can then easily query through our um, API and then run on their own data. So this is then also where the connection comes, right? We have these streamlined models that people can run, and this is very model agnostic. So it's not about like a specific version of an autoencoder or something like this. this is really just infrastructure for you to deploy and run models. Um, and for this to really work, then you need some mechanism of streamlining data also, which is why we connected the two. Yeah, so this uh, global context, but uh, today we'll focus on Sphere data. So what's Sphere data? Um, the data zoo or the data repository, how we sometimes call it. Um, first of all, it's um, a collection of loading scripts. Um, which allow you to load data in a standardized fashion and also to scale this across different scenarios and many data sets. Um, and just so that this is super clear, on the right, I uh, pasted a screenshot of our GitHub. So this is um, part of the Sphere Python package, and you see a lot of photos here, which have names that are essentially derived from DOIs. These folders contain Python scripts, and these scripts are the data loaders that we'll be talking about now. So this script collection in this sense is standardized in the sense that scripts are ordered by DOIs. Um, and then we have a ton of specific constraints on these scripts, which make it A, easier for you to share and B, easier also to write. Yeah, so, yeah. so this is the overall idea. This is strongly compartmentalized. Um, we uh, also provide at this stage already, and later we go into the details, uh, one example of how such a Python script looks like. Um, so this is this. It's a 60-line script. Um, as I said before, don't worry about the details. It's essentially a 60-line class, which defines some characteristics of a data set and some instructions of how to, use, how to load a data set. So throughout the presentation, when we uh, talk about um, data loading script collections, we always talk about this, essentially sets of these classes which are specific to a particular data set. And this is really, um, yeah, so specific to an H5 ID, which may be on some geo server, for example. Um, yeah, and the last thing about the Sphere data is that, uh, so that I want to mention here is that this can be easily interfaced in Python. Um, so here I have an example um, two-liner um, in our API. So this is sort of, um, yeah. So we're, uh, we're trying to integrate this API in the um, Scamper environment. Um, what's going on here is that we initialize an object, which is called DSG, um, which has knowledge of all of the data sets that we have access to in Sphere. Um, and then we subset it to the ones that we want. So here we, selected five data sets by the idea. It doesn't matter too much for now um, how these ideas are derived or how you'd find them. But essentially, with these two lines, you would have access to these five data sets. You could load them through a single load command. So this is essentially it. So in a Python session, when you're working with Spyro and you want to load five data sets with streamlined metadata and streamlined setup annotation, 
this is it. So it's extremely short. Um, yeah. So yeah, so this is the mini pitch of what's Ferris. Um, Leander's gonna take it off um, with some more details on usage now, and then later um, I talk a bit more about how you could contribute data loaders to this. If you wanna ask questions throughout, just post them in the chat, and then, yeah, while Leander's talking, I try to moderate them, and then later we'll switch. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot, David. I'm um, also super excited to be here to um, share with you how Sphira can make your life easier. Um, it definitely has made ours easier already on a daily basis. So I just want to give you now a little more detail on, again, the, the data part of Sphira and um, what it actually does when you, when you use it and, and how you can make it work for yourself. So kind of as a structure, maybe just like six points of what, what Sphira, the data part of Sphira is and, and what it does. Um, so starting off with Sphira data is a kind of directory structure in the first place on your on your local disk and um, it's kind of it manages itself and um, you can it's used basically to structure um, all these data sets that you have um, collected over the years um, as a researcher. So you have a directory structure as shown here on the right. And then um, within this kind of automatically direct, um, created directory structure, each of the data sets has a, um, a defined place. Um, and when we say data set, this could be, um, could be um, one, one uh, data set that was published um, as, a, as a whole, or rather a subset um, of a study that was published. And um, I'm sure as you all aware, those data sets, when you try and grab them from the internet, from the cloud, after they've been published. Um, it can be a bit of a nightmare because they live in all sorts of places. They can live on Geo, they can live on AWS, they can live on Figshare, um, and many more um, examples to add to that. Um, and what Sphira then does is it kind of creates a mapping between this structure on your, or this um, folder structure on your disk and um, the data sets which are stored in all those different uh, repositories. And by creating this mapping, um, Sphira supports just automatically downloading um, these data sets. So um, just imagine, as David said, Sphira as this script collection, which on the one hand manages your, your, local, um, your local data sets on disk um, and creates a mapping to the, to the ones hosted um, or to the ones available publicly. Um, it can pull them um, to your computer for you automatically. So you don't have to worry about where's the link that you, um, and that you get that data set from the specific paper from. Um, and on top of that, of course, Sphira has a lot of data sets in it and you probably don't always wanna download them all. So we of course support just grabbing a subset of the data sets from, um, from the cloud. So you, you never need to never need to get it all, but just you you pick what you need and um, work in kind of a flexible um, compartmentalized manner. Um, now, when when I talk about this mapping between um, online resources and, and data sets in your in your local um, repository, what what's really kind of the the glue in between is that is is what's um, David showed before those those 60 lines of Python code as an example for one data set um, is what we call data loaders. So each data set has an associated data loader and um, that data loader basically is however many lines of Python code that um, are required to um, take that data set basically once it has been downloaded, put it into memory and put it most importantly into, um, into a streamlined format. So we kind of have parts, parts of, or snippets of code, which are structured in a way that you can um, basically load parts of the data that you have on disk and pick the, pick the data sets which are relevant to you right now and very conveniently um, load them and work with them. So I can say, for example, okay, I downloaded now, I don't know, five data sets, which I thought might be relevant. Um, now I wanna load these specific three of them. Um, 
I just select them and um, pick their associated data loaders. And those data loaders in turn um, get the data set from disk out of your, your repository uh, or your directory structure on disk um, and give you, gives you this kind of streamlined um, data object, which is very convenient um, to work with. And when I say, you know, flexible subsetting, like just pick the data sets that you need. This could, this could be done in many different ways, right? For example, you can say, okay, you've you spent a lot of thought thinking about which one you want to download, um, and you could just load all of those together on, um, into memory because that's what you want to work with right now. So that would be the, the leftmost example of how you can load the data. Or rather, you could think, okay, I have, I've downloaded all those 20 data sets, but actually right now I only need these three um, and just load those into, into memory. I just subselected basically. Um, and then a third kind of query that could be interesting is, okay, I downloaded all those data sets and um, kind of built already a rather large um, repository of, of data sets on my disk, which is all nicely managed um, by Sphira. And now I can go into Sphira and say, okay, I'm doing now a study on say mouse lung. Can I just like pull out all the mouse lung data sets um, from my Sphira repository and use them as a reference to, to compare to? So just to, to give you like this um, rough overview of how you can think about pulling or subsetting your, your data sets that you have, that you're managing with Sphira. Now, very briefly, Basically, what happens now if you actually want to load, load a data set? So as I said, or as, as mentioned before, the initial state is kind of that one data set that you're interested in living in some repository, geo, AWS, whatever, on the cloud. Um, so first step is through Sphira, download the data set. Um, so you have a local copy of it. Um, just think like whatever that was provided as like .tsv.gz, you know, some, some format that, that um, account matrix can live in. Um, and then the next step is we use the code in our data loader to load that uh, data set into memory. And um, at the same time, streamline the, the a data object so that A, you kind of know what feature space to expect. So you can easily, for example, concatenate objects and um, B, also um, know which metadata to expect and where to find it, right? Because that's like another struggle. You download the data set, it's never quite clear what data set, uh, what metadata comes with it. Um, does it have cell type annotations? If so, where do they live? It's, it's always a bit of a struggle, right? So with the streamlining aspects, we wanna, we wanna make sure the, the metadata is in defined space. We map our feature space to a, Define space and thereby making use of those a data objects super simple because you just know what you're getting um, beforehand. Now, this kind of loading into memory from the local object, which we refer to as raw loading, um, that can be kind of time consuming, right? If you if if you've ever loaded, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand cells from a compressed CSV file into Python, it can take some time. So what we do is basically the first time we load it, you have to be a little bit patient until, until the loading is done, but then we just write um, a cached file to, um, to disk again. So basically just an H5 ID, which is super, super quickly loaded again. Um, so that the second time you query this data set through Sphira, you basically skip the whole top part, you load directly the cached object into memory, and um, it's like you get a speed up of, I don't know, factor of 100 or even more depending on the data set. Um, so that you kind of cut out the whole um, overhead that it usually takes to, to load those data sets. Um, not only by, because you don't have to write the code anymore to load it, but rather also because on just on the technical side, it's sped up uh, tremendously as well. So this is basically the flow that happens if you want to load a data set with Sphira. Now, a couple words on how you actually interact with that. Um, so you've seen already this code snippet here on the right, you've seen in, in David's, one of David's first slides, and um, you, will, you will see that all we're really doing is instantiating 
a Python class, which here is called dataset supergroups firearm. Um, and this is basically the main object or the main class that you currently interact with as a user of Sphira when you want to load data sets. So th think of this, um, this data set supergroup Sphira as a container that has all the possible data sets in it. And you, you just load it at once without any, any overhead. So this is, this is like, takes less than a second to, to instantiate that object. And then you go, go on and subset this object to the data sets that you're interested in. So either in the example um, that David gave before, you know exactly I want those five data sets from this publication. Um, so you just provide this as a list subset, and then you can just hit load and get those. Or um, as one of the other um, approaches, you provide, for example, I want this species, I want mouse, I want mouse lung data. Just give me all that's there basically in my local repository. Um, and by using these containers, these data set groups, these data set super groups, we basically provide a lot of like convenient functionality around handling multiple data sets at once. Like for example, concatenating data sets um, to a defined um, set of metadata and a, and a unified feature space um, with like minimal amount of coding. Um, so you basically, you have one line kind of commands, which does all sorts of um, convenient stuff with your data set um, groups, which would otherwise be a lot of manual kind of stuff to include. So then lastly, from, from my side, just, a, just an outlook of what's there to come in terms of from a user perspective, um, we're looking at adding soon uh, more modalities or supporting more modalities in the data sets. So, Lots of sightseek data sets nowadays floating around, um, um, especially spliced and unspliced reads are also becoming more, more and more popular because people um, start using a lot of um, RNA velocity um, to analyze their data. So we want to support that as well through Spyro that you can just pull the unspliced reads as well. Um, then there's the aspect of um, cell annotations, which I guess has been um, debated on for, for a long time and still is, and, and we don't expect a data set to have the one correct annotation. So we expect to kind of support also alternative annotations when people disagree and want to use different annotations for a given data set. Um, and then the last point just for um, ambient RNA correction, also a common step in, um, in your RNA seq analysis pipeline. Uh, we want to provide empty droplet data if, if it's provided by, by the author, authors and uh, explicitly serve that to our users. So you can conveniently just um, run your ambient RNA correction without having to find out oh, which of the barcodes in the data set were the empty droplets, um, which can be quite a manual and laborious thing itself. So yeah, in, in terms of the, the plans and new features, we always keep those updated on our read the docs page. So just keep an eye on that and um, we'll keep you posted there on, on what's happening and what's there to come. Great. So then David is going to give you again a bit more detail on how can you actually now uh, help and build this Fire repository and add your own data sets to the repository and thereby actually makes Fira fit your application and your purpose. David. Yeah, cool, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so um, this part now is about how you contribute. Um, briefly, maybe as a piece of motivation for that. Um, so for sure, we are adding a lot of uh, data loaders for public data sets already as is. Um, but yeah, of course we can't add all of them. So uh, if you're working on a project where you require a large data set collection and some of these are not there, then yeah, there's sort of the incentive for you to add the remaining few like percent or so of loaders that are yet missing and still making use of the already done work that is inherent and in the other data loaders that we publicize. Uh, the other aspect is that um, if you learn how to write these data loaders, it's more easy for you to work with private data in the context of public data with Swire. Um, so we have mechanisms that allow you um, to 
relatively easily co-handle um, universes of private and public data. And for your private data universe, you of course have to write the data rules on your own because yeah, nobody else has access to that data. So yeah, so um, there's some reasons for you um, to not only expose yourself to the um, data consumption part of this. Um, and um, yeah, so we try to uh, capture um, how we want to, like where we want to go with the contribution experience on this first slide here. Um, so first of all, um, code that is contributed as a data loader is essentially, um, this is somebody writing a piece of code that is ideally used by everybody else that also works on this data set because that ensures um, that this code is checked again and again, which um, is a mechanism to detect errors in metadata annotation, for example, or just generally bugs um, that are otherwise probably often going to go unnoticed. Um, yeah, and it's also a mechanism for the community as such to just move faster because there's less time wasted in that sense on rewriting code that's already been written. So for this purpose, um, one core necessity, necessity that we identified was that this has to be searchable relatively easily. Um, the way we structured this now is by DOI. So essentially every data set is uh, identified by a DOI of an accompanying manuscript. And this is the mechanism for you also to search for these data loaders or for these data sets in our data zoo. Um, then um, we want to make the contribution experience nice uh, to incentivize the code contribution, which we do um, by minimizing the code amount that is in these scripts. So for example, in this example script that I showed before on the first slide, um, but also the complexity of this. Um, so you notice there that this was one class, um, which inherited from a parent class. Um, we need this to some degree, but we really try to keep this to a minimum. So you can deal with this also if you haven't been exposed to object-oriented programming before. Um, then, um, and this is uh, also in relation to a question that was asked in the chat uh, a couple of minutes ago, um, we guide metadata annotation. Um, so sorry, our metadata um, maintenance essentially relies on ontologies. Um, and during contribution of data loaders, we check that whatever you're defining for a particular data set is something that makes sense from the viewpoint of the ontology. It could still be that you're saying something completely wrong, but at least it would be, um, it would satisfy the ontology constraints. And then lastly, uh, we invested quite a lot of effort in making um, setup annotation based on a set ontology easier and less iterative going to a website and looking some cells up. Yeah, so essentially all of these things are reflected in code that is within Spira and that is through different mechanisms channeled through uh, the data loaders when you use it. But during data loading writing, you essentially don't see any of this, which is yeah nice because you don't have to deal with that. So yeah, so um, Addressing a lot of these points, we'll go through um, one of these data loader scripts. So this would be a Python file that could be contributed in a pull request that would add a particular data set to Sphira. Um, so we we'll start with the class structures. So the first line of this script at the top in the um, black box. So there we define a class data set that inherits from a parent class. Um, this parent class was also commented early on before by Olga, it has a very long name. Um, this, uh, there's a few of these uh, potential parent classes and we have a sort of decision tree which one to choose. And we're also automat uh, automizing this right now. Um, yeah, essentially the set, it's very simple settings that determine which one of these you choose. By the end of the day, you'll uh, end up with this one class that's called data set up there. Then this class has a constructor, so this dev in it and line 22 and a load function dev underscore load and 50. So now we will first talk about this constructor, so the init class. This constructor defines metadata. Um, yeah, if you look at a couple of these lines here, it uh, defines stuff like the download website of a data set. It defines where setup annotation is uploaded, if it was uploaded separately. It defines an author, a DOI, 
um, normalization of the count data that is then later loaded. Um, it defines an organ, an organism, a protocol, so here, connect sequencing, um, year when this was published, a couple of these. So that's essentially 10 or so of these core attributes um, that we try to define for a data set. And importantly is, so important is that um, you don't have to have access to all of them to contribute a data loader. So data loader can consist of a very, very small constructor with hardly any information in it. But the core philosophy is essentially that um, because a lot of people will be looking for data sets through subsetting operations. So for example, they will be looking for pancreas mouse data sets. If this is a pancreas mouse data set, but the contributing person did not indicate that it's pancreas, but they just said it's something mouse, but I don't know which organ, then this one is gonna fall through, right? So essentially, by adding more metadata, you make this visible to more people. Yeah. Um, but in principle, it's not an issue that, um, yeah, for example, um, the, yeah, um, you don't know um, a good definer for the exact state of the sample, for example. Um, then, um, with respect to ontologies and allowed entries for these metadata items, um, the organ, so pancreas here, um, is an anatomical location from where the sample was collected. And it makes sense to constrain this in an anatomic ontology. So here we chose Uberon. Um, and similarly, um, there's other ontologies for other metadata also. So there's a couple of organizations who spend a lot of time structuring these vocabularies um, and yeah, providing these ontologies in an interfaceable manner. And we interface these ontologies. And when you write a data loader and you say um, the organ should be pancreas underscore um, 2017, <clears throat> then this is not a, a term that pops up in this Uber ontology. And when you run unit tests on this, so an aspect that we'll come to later, the testing of these data loaders, this will immediately tell you pancreas 2017 is not an anatomical structure and you have to change that. And then we have ways of suggesting to you how you should be changing this. So in this example, what um, Sphero would be doing, or more specifically the Sphero unit test, um, it would run um, string matchings from this pancreas underscore 2017 to the um, Uber on terms, and it would probably um, emit pancreas as a potential hit. So it would tell you, hey, this is not an atomic structure, but maybe you wanted to say pancreas. And you, then you can fix that in the code. And yeah, um, so end of the day, um, this is how we um, constrain these terms to be part of the ontologies. Essentially, we choose one ontology for every metadata item that we deem necessary to be constrained, um, and then we enforce this during data set contribution. Similar also um, for the protocol, so here I wrote EFO terms. Um, this is another ontology for experimental setup. Um, that has um, structure for single cell sequencing protocols also, which is um, nice um, because you can distinguish different chemistries, uh, nuclear and non-nuclear cells. Um, yeah, essentially the main things that pop up in the single cell culture. Um, yeah, so online we've also um, annotated a bit which ontologies we have right now for which metadata items and which we'll have in the near future. So uh, when looking at this, you can also guide your decision making a bit by that. So next up is the cell type annotation. It's um, essentially a special case of metadata annotation. Um, here, the core philosophy is um, that we don't want to require re-annotation at the step of data loader contribution. So data loader contribution should really be just interfacing everything that's out there. If cell types are annotated, that should be fine. If they were not annotated, then this is just a data set that doesn't have cell type annotation. But what is often the case is that if there was setup annotation, that these are um, what people in this community then often call free text cell type labels. So these are cell type labels that don't necessarily conform to an ontology. Again, as before the pancreas 2017 example, this could be some T cell something something high expressed label, for example, or um, some weird way of um, spelling T-cell um, that doesn't match the cell ontology. Um, 
and to um, yeah map these to the cell ontology, we set up CSV files. So I have an example here on the right, where we have the source cell types. So this is a yeah, it's an example of a pancreas sample. So we have axonar cells, alpha cells, and here clearly, like in the context of a pancreatic sample, right? Like people would know what this alpha refers to, but in general, this is not a unique cell identifier because I mean alpha also pops up in the context of T cells. Yeah. Um, so um, what we do is that um, we so we require these um, cell type mappings essentially, and then on the right hand side there's the like official term in the cell ontology, and um, to make contribution of these a bit easier, um, we auto generate them when you first run the data loader tests and um, put suggestions in the right column. So essentially run string matching and we run anatomic constraints um, to subset potential valid IDs for a cell. Um, this, yeah, this can't always be perfect, but this works relatively well because cell ontology has links to Uberon. So if you give the anatomic location of the sample, um, we can derive essentially the subset of terms or official cell type ontology terms that should appear in this anatomy, which is a much smaller set than everything, right? So there alpha is already like something much more descriptive. Um, yeah, and so we use string matching and these anatomic ideas essentially to come up with good first guesses there. And then um, everything, like all that you have to do is essentially to delete these together to the best match. And if it's unclear, you can still go back to one of the ontology websites and essentially just look the cell type up. But overall, this workflow is much less laborious than going through the website every time. Um, yeah, and end of the day, this is then a very useful thing um, because there could be cases in which these maps are not 100% clear because the original annotation was just not descriptive enough. Um, and having these maps then allows us to um, yeah, essentially discriminate these cases. And also moving on later, when we would be talking, as in the future, when we were talking about multiple annotation files, um, this is a very modular approach to how we map into a cell ontology. Yeah, so this is essentially how we handle a cell ontology, uh, or a set of annotation, essentially free text and whatever you're loading. So the edit object that you're initially loading, um, could have any naming, but we'll then constrain the names for one of these CSV files. Yeah, so now to the loading code. Um, so this referred to attributes of um, an undata object instance, um, which, yeah, so in the case of cell types, I would like really be an undata.ops column. So it's a table that is indexed by cells and it has different cell-wise attributes. One of them could be a cell type. Um, all of these um, proper, so all of these data items are loaded in the underscore load function of the data set. So here, this is boxed in the black box again. So now we're down to the uh, second and last method of this class. Um, this is very simple Python loading code. I would say, for example. Um, so. I think in most cases, this function looks a lot like a cell in a Jupyter notebook that I would write to load exactly this data set without any metadata harmonization or gene space filtering or something like this. Um, so this also makes it um, easy for you to copy over loading code from existing Jupyter notebooks, for example. Um, and the core function that this um, method fulfills is that it sets a dot data object of this class, which is then later used by everything else, right? So like you can think of this as the outcome of a Jupyter notebook, a cell that loads a data set, it would set a data object instance in the namespace of this Python session. This one just sets this data object as an attribute of this class. It's the same also, it's the same outcome, it's the same code, it only says self dot in front of the data every time. Um, and um, Important now to realize is that um, because Aspire has um, this ton of functionalities about like data harmonization and cage loading and stuff in the back end, um, 
this is all stuff that you don't have to worry about anymore now. This is only really the initial loading and everything else is essentially already implemented and it's just gonna be taken over from uh, methods that come through inheritance from the parent class into this class. Um, so this is always very brief. You don't have to harmonize anything or subset anything, you just load it, put it into a data and then Sarah's gonna take care of the rest. Now, um, in the beginning, I said that um, we structure the data loaders by DOIs, so by studies. Um, in a lot of studies now, uh, people publish multiple data sets, right? So um, it could be different batches or different conditions, um, sometimes even like really like a separate question or really a different line of sampling uh, that can be employed. Um, so um, it can be the case that you need multiple data loaders for one study. It is often though the case that the authors try to somehow harmonize their common matrices or their general output before uploading um, so that um, in principle, um, repeated data loaders for every data set would contain heavily repeated code. And we avoid this with this mechanism here. So essentially we're saying, um, here, this dot is uh, the dot on the far left is uh, DOI. So this is one study. This DOI could consist of only a single data set. So this is an easy case in which you just write a single one of these classes that I just showed before, and you're done. Now, um, if you have more data sets, um, they could come, so n data sets, they could come as one file per data set. Um, if it was the case that these were then also not streamlined, then you would actually have to write n of those classes, so n of these Python files. It's hardly ever the case, and that would be sort of not ideal practice also by the uploading entity. And I have honestly never seen it, um, just for you to understand this process. If it is the case that they're streamlined, um, then again, you only have to write a single class, uh, which is now inheriting uh, from a different parent class, um, as alluded to in the chat before and we take care of compartmentalizing this for you. This is important because later um, analysts wanna have access to the individual batches or to the individual conditions of this, right? We don't wanna have like a static, extremely large and data object with which we can only interact after loading into memory. We wanna have access to the individual most fine-grained partitions of this. Um, and then similar, if these end data sets are one file, so this also exists, um, then we have a separate class which takes care of this. Importantly though, and now it doesn't matter which of these four branches you're in, um, the Python file that you're writing looks almost the same. So it's always this one class that has a constructor, a constructor and a load function. Um, all additional functionalities that deal with multiple files, one file, whatever, um, they are all inherited um, and completely hidden from you. Um, so you essentially only have to decide which of these settings you're in and then inherit from the right class and then just write the script as you were. So one example. David? Yeah. Maybe just one, before we jump to the example, one question from the chat. So um, Olga was asking about um, the, the study attributes that we um, that users can provide in the, in the data loaders. Like take, for example, like when you provide the state exact do we also enforce any sort of um, schema or, or vocabulary on those? So she gives the example of, say, uh, diabetes versus someone saying uh, diabetic for the state exact. Yeah. Yeah. So um, state exact is right now, by definition, a uh, free text field. Um, what we want to add though is a disease field which would be constrained by a disease ontology so there this diabetic or diabetes would then be constrained um we likely keep the state exact field though because it's sort of a buffer for information that cannot yet be easily dealt with um it is just the case that some fields have some interesting metadata that really don't show up in other fields and we don't want to miss out on this entirely. Um, so we allow this to be yielded and state exact. But yeah, um, for sure, uh, whether or not a sample was from a diabetic individual is something that you can streamline, but this would be as a separate metadata item that is easy scan. Yeah. And it's in principle, it's not an issue if this loader 
only has this diabetes um, annotation in the future field and not in the constraint um, disease field, it is only the case that then later, when you or somebody else goes back into the library and looks for diabetic cases, they will not find it right. Because this search for diabetic or samples derived from diabetic individuals, this search is only, it's based on the um, disease ontology then, yeah. Awesome, cool. So basically, while we would like to constrain everything, it doesn't always make sense. And then there is a trade off, I guess, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Cool. And maybe just a follow up question that um, just came in um, from from Emma. So asking whether there's just one custom metadata column now allowed allowed in the um, in the loaders or are there multiple kind of free text um, fields? Yeah, good question. Yeah. Um... So there's a few that are not yet constrained by ontologies, um, but there's uh, there's a relatively clear incentive what they should reflect for each of these. Um, I'm not sure if you have something specific in mind. Um, we can yeah, we can also talk about it later on an issue. Um, essentially, if you see something that's not captured, but by what we have right now, we can happily and easily add it. Um, because yeah, as we said before, it's not an issue that an item is not set in other data loaders. We can add this now in the process and just gradually phase it in. Yeah. Right, right. I guess, I mean, she's she's giving the, the example of three prime versus five prime 10x sequencing. I think that's also part of an ontology that we use, right? Like if we could provide it in a more fine-grained way. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So this is an experimental protocol and this is part of EFO. So this you would be able to, yeah, distinguish there, yeah. Right, it's just that in the example we just showed, we, we didn't provide that information. Okay. No, exactly, but um, yeah, okay, very good point. Um, nice about ontologies is um, that you don't have to stick to the most fine-grained leaves, right? right. Um, so if I don't know um, which chemistry this was based on, I only know, for example, this was a, uh, a droplet basis, say. This is a protocol information that's hard coded in an ontology. Um, and this is still useful information, right? Because it still subsets the space. Um, a particular five prime chemistry would be um, a leaf in that ontology, right? Like I always think of these ontologies as directed as like graphs or trees. Right. Um, so, yeah, so this information we would give there. Cool. Well, so I guess we. Um... We will have time to answer more questions towards the end. And now I'm keen to hear an example of your structured data loading. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, so um, brief recap. Uh, we have these four cases so far um, of ways that data sets within one DOI can be structured, um, yeah. which is important to consider when you start writing the data loaders for that. So the first one is the easiest one. Um, it's just one data set. So we have to write one data set class. And in the easiest case, this could look something like this here. It's essentially a version of what I showed before. Um, it inherits from a class that's called dataset base. It would set some metadata entries in the data loader constructor. So here in the init. So it would again have protocol equals to five prime chemistry or something like this. Um, and then it would have the load code here, right? So you just fill this in and then you're done. This is essentially this study done then. And now contrast this to a case where you also have one study, but multiple data sets that come in different streamlined files. The corresponding um, Python file that you'd have to write looks like this. So it's almost exactly the same. The only difference is that here the parent class is different and you have to indicate the file names that you want to load from here. Um, but then again, you have one constructor and uh, one load function that defines how you would load any of these objects. Um, yeah, so essentially no extra code. And um, yeah, you also, you don't have to come up with this code on your own. So we have uh, both of these cases as templates um, online. So if you go to our docs, um, you'll find those. Um, so you essentially can just copy these over in the state that they are in now and then just fill your stuff in. So yeah, you don't actually have to like remember any of these class names. Um, then, um, yeah, may maybe on this note also, um, we also almost done with uh, writing a shell application that um, creates these 
by default. So these templates that you can either copy yourself um, um, to the location and then rename stuff. Um, we are also writing a shell application that you can yeah, run essentially like we also run good um, to um, create these depending on the choice that you're in. And this is then going to reflect exactly these uh, questions here. So do you have more, uh, multiple data sets? Is it one file per data set or a single one? Um, yeah, so just keep this in mind. Um, Lucas and our group has been working on this a lot last week um, and we'll probably be pushing out this soon. Um, this is gonna make this experience a bit nicer even then. Just the last point um, on this part here on the slide. Um, of course, it can also be the case that um, one study has multiple uh, cases of these here, right? So it could have one non-streamlined data set and five streamlined data sets. Then you'd just be writing two Python files, right? So like essentially all this does is keep redundant code low and as low as possible. Here, if you have one group of data sets that look alike, and one separate one, then you'd write two data loaders. And if you have any questions with that, uh, when you give this a go, just like shoot us questions. We can, yeah, yeah. We have to talk about this and like GitHub issues or short video conferences or anything. But um, I think once you get the hang of this, this is it's a really nice way of interfacing these data sets. Then um, after that, ideally, you will have a first draft of the data loads that you want to contribute or that you want to use locally only because they are for private data sets. Um, there can, of course, be still bugs in there, and you might have, mistake, you might have made mistakes with um, the metadata annotation. Um, and we want to help with um, fixing those um, already locally, so in the stage of when you're writing this by providing a standardized unit test for these. So it's a software development concept. Um, you can run this relatively easily in any Python IDE. And what this unit test does is it tries uh, loading this um, data set based on the loading instructions that you gave. It checks that the metadata um, are allowed under the ontologies that we use. So for example, that it says pancreas and not pancreas angular score 2017. Um, and it shows any bugs that could appear in the loading script, right? Like, yeah, you could have just made NumPy errors or something like that. Then, um, once this completed for the first time, so at this point, you're sure that at least your metadata, uh, metadata entries are okay and that there's no drastic bugs in your loading script. This also auto generates um, this um, cell type map that I mentioned before. So if you have cell type annotation, um, this is going to generate this draft CSV file of free text setup names to propose suggestions of setup names directly in your GitHub directory. So you can then just go into this, uh, so directly in your package clone or whatever. Um, you can just go into the CSV file, then mitigate this, as I said before, essentially just choose the one that fits best and maybe go to the website for the two or three where you're a bit unsure. Um, then once you mitigated this, so essentially delete everything else out, um, it's already there, right? So you can just immediately commit it and it's done. So this is then cell type harmonization done. Um, then you can run the unit test one last second time, um, making sure that these um, annotations are valid. So the setup annotations now, and then you essentially go to go to contribute it. Um, yeah, so essentially uh, think of this unit test as a way of helping you to stick to the um, requirements, essentially, that we have two data loaders, and also a way to really make cell type annotation drastically more easy for you. You could also do this um, um, cell type matching, so the free text cell type name matching to the ontology outside of this unit test, but this unit test is just a yeah, very standardized and nice way of doing it because it puts it directly into your Git path. Yeah, so this is the major part of the presentation already, some last remarks. Um, we are currently finishing an overhaul of Sphera data, um, which is why we have been um, a bit cautious with releasing tutorial code, because essentially we want everybody to be using the new API, which will be stable starting this week or next week. Um, but already um, data loader contribution works, so we're already updating data loaders to this. 
Um, and if you want to start trying um, to write your own data loaders, you can start this now. You just have to do it on uh, the dev branch on GitHub. And two last points just to make this stick with everybody. Um, start writing the uh, data loaders from templates. So right now you can copy them very soon. So probably next week, you will also be able to auto-generate these uh, template copies with a shell application. Um, avoid duplication of data loaders, right? It's, um, yeah, it's uh, maybe a bit sad if you spend half an hour writing one and then you will find out during the pull request that somebody's already written that. So we really try to make this really obvious what's out there already. So essentially connecting the data loaders to DOIs makes this searchable very well. So you can search this on our website. So this um, uh, GUI website that we have. You can also search this on GitHub in the code or in issues. Um, the shell application that we push will also allow you to search this. Just yeah, make, make sure to do that. Um, and um, last slide. Um, three users or samples, just to get you a bit excited about the potential that this could have for your project. So like where it could um, make your life easier. Um, What's fire data is good at is, for example, if you want to loop over organs or essentially loop over sets of or partitions of metadata um, that can appear, for example, if you want to fit a model on multiple organs. We did that in our paper, for example, that we just fit cell type classifiers and embedding models over like, I don't know, like 40 organs, one organism in parallel. And it's essentially the step from doing this for one organ to 40 organs is just in other two lines also in Spyro, um, because we have access to the structured vocabulary, which makes everything that is automated very, very easy. So um, yeah, for your own life, you can, or for your own um, projects, you can start thinking about where could I generalize what I'm doing right now to more settings, because it's gonna come at essentially zero cost in coding for you. Um, you can also use this to define a specific target set. So you might only be interested in like seven specific data sets that you always work on. And it, your entire study is going to be based on that because you're benchmarking something very specific or you're integrating them and you want to make some point about some cell state that you're finding. Um, so here, sorry, it's nice because it's easy to define this. So you can easily just load these seven. It's again, much, much fewer code than if you were actually to write the loading script in your uh, notebook. And it's very reproducible, right? So this loading code that you're then using for whatever study you are doing um, can directly be reproduced by somebody else with them, yeah, essentially without them even looking at your code. And then lastly, um, because you don't have to worry about finding download websites now, and you don't have to worry about like how you would load whatever format somebody decided to upload their data in, um you could um look at public data sets more often so before so let's say you're working on human heart and there's 10 data sets out there so maybe before you wouldn't have uh, downloaded and analyzed all of them um but you would have restricted yourself to three or so, uh, three or so of these um now because this loading code is so easy right you can if you have like a really short thing like you want to um, you want to look at the maximal expression of some gene in a cell type in this particular setting, right? You can really easily run this. Um, so really, yeah, just as like some inspiration for like how this could be useful for you. Yeah, and this is it already. Um, so this was um, the introduction to Sphere data usage and contribution. Um, yeah, we want to say thanks to everybody involved in the Sphero um, project in our group. So it's a relatively large group of people who had different contributions. And yeah, there's a lot more to come also in the future. As mentioned before, um, we try to really oh, yeah, openly and clearly communicate this on our read the docs. Essentially, this is coming soon, or this is like a bit more like a midterm goal. Um, yeah, and really hope that you get involved or that you find this useful. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions now.